Well, it's great to see you. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Phil Harrison. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Bolton. I'll get it right this week. And uh, you are so welcome here in the room, or if indeed you're watching online as well this morning. Can I just say, from the very outset this morning, uh, just to follow up from something that Pastor Derek said last week, I am not, or ever have been, or ever have any intention of being a landscape gardener. <laughs> I am not going to be putting a picture of my back garden on the screen this morning because I would feel somewhat inadequate because Pastor Derek has really set the, uh, the bench quite high. But today is the second part of our series, The Secret Garden. Now, when whoever, I'm guessing it was Pastor Derek, came up with this series I don't think he had me in mind, or at least he fully had a bit of a joke in mind, because I am not in any way uh, green-fingered. Um, when I grew up, my dad had the most chronic hay fever, and he wasn't really able to show me how it was done. My father-in-law, I think, gave up very quickly, knowing that I was something of a lost cause. When we first got married, Claire and I, we lived over in Walkden, and uh, Growing outside the house was a wisteria plant. I wonder if you could put that picture up for me. And a wisteria plant is supposed to look a little bit like that. It's one of those plants that grows on the outside. It climbs. And there was a space where it grew between our front door and the garage door. And, of course, it was supposed to grow over the top and make this lovely feature a little bit like the one there in the picture that you can see. But... I realised that it had overgrown a little bit and Claire had gone out and I thought this, this is a really great opportunity for me to do a little bit of cutting back, a little bit of pruning and so I got out the shears and what happened next was a little bit like one of those cartoons that you might see from time to time with a guy trying to cut his moustache where he takes a little bit off this side and he thinks no it, it's a bit too long on this side now and he cuts a bit off here and by the time he's finished there is no moustache at all. And by the time Claire got back, this wisteria plant was nothing more than a stump. <laughs> and I'm thinking, great, I won't have to do this again for a while. And Claire's thinking, he's going to kill the thing. I am far from being an expert. And uh, we actually have, I'll let you into a little secret. We actually have somebody who comes and looks after our front garden. A, because I can't be bothered and B, because it's too much of a hassle to get all the tools through from the back of the house. But often when our garden and the plants and so on have been looked after, particularly when it gets near to winter, I'll come home and I'll think, he's butchered them. All those lovely plants, all those lovely flowers are just lying there on the floor. And I'm thinking, he's killing my plants, he's killing my flowers. But actually, I know because he's a gardener, he knows what he's talking about. And actually, in doing what he's doing, he's actually prolonging life. He's encouraging the life in those plants uh, to grow. And actually, when you prune something, you're actually increasing its growth, its fruitfulness. And with that in mind, I want us to read this morning from John chapter 15. We read this last week, but it's a, it's a theme for what we're talking about. So John chapter 15. And we're going to read the first eight verses. Jesus is talking and he says this, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. 
Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. When we were online uh, just a few weeks ago, we enjoyed our storyteller series. And we know what a great teller of stories Jesus was. And one thing that Jesus liked to do was when he told a story, he used, liked to use a prop. He used, to like, he used rather what was there as an illustration. And on the night before Jesus went to the cross, he gave a bit of a sermon to his disciples. They'd shared communion together and they'd set out ultimately to when Jesus was going to be arrested and tried and so on. But on the way, Jesus and his disciples almost certainly went through a vineyard. And so on this occasion, Jesus used it to make this point. And so he uses this, this metaphor, this, this gardening metaphor, to describe the importance of growing spiritually and drawing strength from him, the true vine. I wonder if you could put verse 2 back up for us, please. It said this, He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. Jesus is telling the disciples, and does this morning, that he's setting us apart for a lifestyle of bearing fruit. And that fruit was going to come as a result of God's intentional pruning. I'm not a gardener. If I was, I think I would know that a gardener doesn't let his fruit, his crop, grow just wildly on its own. To get the best out of your plant, that gardener has to follow the established rules. And in this case, the rules of pruning. In that you cut away the dead, the overgrown branches to give it the best chance. And before any grapes can be picked and can be made into wine, pruning has to happen. And so this morning, in the time that we've got, we're going to look at this subject, pruning to blooming. Pruning to blooming. The branches that Jesus was talking about were unique in the same way that we are unique and Jesus, the way he prunes us, won't look the same for us as it might do for somebody else. He's going to prune us differently. But that is a process, because he is the gardener, the ultimate gardener, a process that we can entrust to him. He knows what he's doing. And that verse said that whether we're bearing fruit or whether we're not, we are going to be pruned. And I want us to think about three things today as we think about these, these, the passage that we've read. And the first thing is this. Pruning can be painful. Pruning can be painful. I looked online at various dictionaries in the hope that I might find a definition of this word pruning that didn't involve some form of cutting. Put your hand up if you think that sounds pleasant. It doesn't, does it? But... It's necessary. It's painful, but it's necessary. And pruning occurs, according to the experts, for two reasons. One, when there's too much growth. A bit like my wisteria plant. Too much pruning in that case, but there was too much growth in the first place. And secondly, when there's not enough growth. So the gardener will cut away to give that plant the best chance of producing fruit in the future. And some things in our lives have to be pruned from time to time. When that happens and when God cuts those things back, it's not a mistake. Even when we think it is. And it's hard. And it's certainly hard when we're going through stuff, isn't it? And it's confusing at times. And it certainly can be painful. And when we're in that moment and that situation or that difficulty or struggle that we're in, we don't sort of stand there going, oh, it's great, God's doing a bit of pruning, a bit of cutting. <laughs> it hurts. It's not something we enjoy. But it's not a mistake. 
And sometimes when we're going through that, we don't see beyond the pruning. We don't see beyond the situation. But God does. Because God wants to give us a more fruitful future. Try and say that a few times. God cares about us in those situations. When we're going through stuff, he recognises that it hurts, it's difficult. But he's looking at the bigger picture. He's looking at the fact that we're able to produce fruit that's going to last if we're allowing ourselves to be pruned. If you're a parent in here this morning, you may have said these words to your child. I bet if you are, well, we're all children, aren't we? I bet for many of us, you'll have heard those words. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Never quite understood that as a kid. But as a parent, you begin to understand it, don't you? Because you want your children to grow up the best way that they possibly can. And when you see your children suffer, it's hard when you see that immediate reaction. Nobody likes to see their child upset. But we punish our children because long term we care about them, don't we? And we care about the person that they will ultimately become. And so we do it for their benefit. Pruning doesn't feel good when it happens. But we have to recognise that God does not have bad intentions for us. There might be certain things that used to be fruitful. Maybe something, you know, 12 months ago. That was great. I thought this was good. God, why are you cutting this away? Why are you pruning this? Why are you taking it away? Can I just say today, stop living in the past. Stop living in the past. Live in the now because God wants to give you a future that is fruitful. And if you want to move into that new season, don't be surprised if God needs to do some pruning in your life. And when God trims things back, he does it so things can grow, doesn't he? And when that happens, there's going to be more fruit than there was before the pruning started. I'm going to go back to that verse again. Verse 2. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. I know the situations in my life where I felt that God has pruned me. I know many of you know us, but for those who don't, Claire and I have two sons, Sam and Jacob. And Jacob, who's the younger one, uh, he's, what, 21 now. And we, we uh, had a, a healthy baby boy. And four weeks later, we got up one morning to find Jacob in the cot and he wasn't breathing. And so we, he was rushed off in an ambulance. He was taken to one of the children's hospitals. And we were told that Jacob's chances of making it through that situation were extremely slim. And I know Nick shared the story of Evie this morning. And I think it's fair to say that in that situation, I always trusted God. But that's not to say I didn't question things. I didn't sort of say, God, why are you letting this happen? And it was hard. It was painful. It was difficult. But I believe that God used that situation, and J Jacob, thankfully, is, is absolutely fine. In fact, he's more painful uh, than, <laughs> than he perhaps was of the, of the situation. But that's another story. But I believe that God used that situation to prune some things in my life. And I believe that coming out on the other side, I'm probably a better dad, I'm probably a better husband. I'm probably just a better all-round nice bloke. <laughs> Do you know, God is always working. Whatever the situation you're in, however hard it feels, however strange it feels, God is working in it. And you might not always be able to see it. You might not be able to deal with it at the time very well, and it might be painful. But never take your eyes off the fact that God is in control. That God is supreme. So pruning can be painful. Secondly, pruning 
can purify. I wonder if we can look again at verse 3. It says this, you have already been pruned and purified by the message, or in the NIV that says word. So by the word I have given you. God's word are a little bit like his shears or his secateurs, if you like. God's word will cut you. It will get into you so that God can do what he needs to do. Listen to this other verse from Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. You can't read the Bible for more than a few minutes without being confronted by God in some way. And you can be reading, have a nice quiet time, you can be encouraged, and suddenly, bam, he hits you, he cuts deep, he gets right in. And we don't like it because it's judging our attitudes. It's judging our thoughts. And we can compare the Bible to a mirror because it shows us up for exactly who we are and what we're doing. But it allows God to get in, to open us up and to do the work that he needs to do. Today, let God's word, let the Bible be a pruning force in your life. Let it show you the things that need to go the things that need to stay, perhaps. And though, again, it can hurt. It's a bit depressing, this message, isn't it? And though it can hurt, it's in a good way. And, you know, we can come out of that saying, God, thanks for showing me that. Thank you for working in me. Maybe now I've got a marriage that's better. Maybe now I'm a better parent because you opened me up. What is it today that God needs to purify in you? What is it that needs pruning? What is it in your life, maybe, that you need detaching from? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you're a Christian and the person that you're with isn't. And you're perhaps thinking, well, I'm strong enough. I'm the stronger person that I believe that that my my partner, my, my girlfriend, my boyfriend is going to come to Jesus. I know so many people who've disappeared without trace because they've been in the wrong relationship. Maybe it's an unhealthy lifestyle. Perhaps you're here on a Sunday. Maybe you've been at a course in the week. But if you looked at your life for the rest of the week, there would be no comparison. People wouldn't recognise you as somebody who was at church, somebody who was a Christian. Maybe you're not prepared to let go or to change. Or allow God to change you. Maybe it's an unhealthy attitude. Maybe you've got this real deep-seated issue with somebody and you're not prepared to let it go or to forgive. And you've held this grudge and it's still there. Maybe it's tradition or religion, whatever that might look like. When I was about 15, I went on a beach mission. And I'm not trying to knock beach missions here because what it did for me was amazing. But I remember on this beach mission, the leader of this team, he was talking to us about a verse in the Bible that talks about lifting up holy hands. So he said, I don't believe that we should lift up our hands when we worship because, you know, whose hands are holy? And that sort of stuck with me. And for many, 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 many years, I really struggled to be free when I was worshipping. Thankfully today I know that I am holy because God sees me that way. And so I can lift my hands. I can dance and jig about if I really want to. I'm not quite sure how that would go down. But I can be free as I like. I can be as free as I like because God sees me as holy because of what Jesus did. Don't be resistant to what God wants to do in you today. Allow God to do what he needs to. Because he wants to take away that dead wood that's holding you back. When we think about pruning, we perhaps think about uh, that it's taking away, in terms of our pruning, taking away those things that we've created, maybe that relationship that we've just talked about. But as I've thought about and looked about it this week, I read an article 
written by somebody who knows a bit more about pruning than I do. And it said this, Pruning is also an opportunity to get control over weeds, identify vine diseases, and address pest concerns before they become significant issues. I'm tempted to say God wants to get rid of the pests in your life. But God isn't just interested in the things that we've put there. God prunes us to protect us from external influences as well. He stops those things getting in that shouldn't be there. He wants to stop voices that influence us and try to lead us in the wrong direction. I said it before, I'll say it again. God is the expert gardener. He knows exactly when pruning should take place. He knows what kind of pruning should take place. And we just have to trust him in that as he does it. It might look different for us than it does for somebody else, as I said, and vice versa. No two plants are the same. No two people are the same. God's got different plans for you as he has for me. In that article I mentioned a minute ago, it talks about winter being the ideal time to do that pruning or to at least to separate the healthy wood from the dead and the damaged. And when the situation that we're in, whether it be bereavement, whether it be uh, loss of a job or a breakup, those are the times in our lives, aren't they, that can feel like winter. But God uses those situations. God uses those times of winter in our life to do the pruning that he needs to. And how often is it that we come out on the other side of those times ready to go? ready to produce, ready to make the fruit that Jesus wants us to. But that can only happen if we are attached. God can't prune us if we've already fallen off or we've decided to detach ourselves. And sometimes we do that and we run at the first sign of any trouble and we flounder. And we'll be like those branches that we read about that are just thrown away. And so our final point is this. Pruning needs perseverance. Pruning needs perseverance. Pastor Derek preached a great message last week about our need to be rooted. And for us to allow God to prune us and to purify us, there's something key for us to do. Let me read verses 4 and 5 again. I'm going to read them from a slightly different translation from the New King James Version. They say this. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. For us to be able to bloom, we need to persevere with that need to remain connected to him. As I said before, if we are not connected, God can't prune us and there is no point in him pruning us. But you notice in that version that we just read, instead of saying that we remain, it talked about abiding. And if we think of it in those terms, that word abide, it means uh, to settle down, it means to be at home. So let's think of it in those terms for a moment. I love to go on holiday whenever, wherever that might be in the future. We've recently postponed our silver wedding trip for the second time so that it'll probably be our golden wedding by the time we actually get to celebrate it. But when my holiday is over, there is nothing I like more than that feeling of getting home, putting on my slippers, getting my own bed, just feeling relaxed, feeling at home and feeling chilled. And home is where you can settle down. It's where you can relax. It's where you abide. But you know what? We can treat treat Jesus like he's a bit like a holiday home. Somewhere we just go to from time to time. He is where we should be abiding. He is where we can settle where we can just be with him, know him well. And just as our home, that natural setting when we come back from holiday 
Or maybe we've had a particularly hard day at work and we just want to get home and flop. We need to, in our spirit, settle down as well. And Jesus is that place, that person, where we can settle down. Rest in him. Abide in him. He makes you at home with him. But you know that abiding is a process. Over our married life, Claire and I, I've reckoned it up this week, we've lived in seven different homes. And each move was a bit stressful. I'll say that, the last time we moved, I was on the King's Overnighter. And by the time I got home, it had all been done. So that was great. Good tip for you there, gents. The removal men had gone. It was all done. But when you move home, it's not just sort of an instant, I'm in, that's it, done. There's time, isn't there, to settle. Time to have to unpack boxes. It doesn't always feel home straight away. And in the same way, if you planted a vine and you sat and watched it, apart from being very sad, you'd realise that the grapes aren't going to appear just like that, are they? Abiding is something of a process. It's really a lifelong process. And it works slowly, but faithfully and naturally. Just as life comes through the vine and into the branch, Jesus wants to work through you and me. I never thought I'd say this as part of a preach. I've been reading about sap this week. I know how to party. And uh, I discovered that there are two main types of sap. Any sap experts in the room can correct me afterwards. Uh, Xylem sap and phloem sap. And I found out that maple syrup is made from sap. Didn't know that before. I even found a video where you can sit and watch sap coming out of a tree. And the page's author said this, under ideal conditions, maple sap flows rapidly at 90 drips per minute. At this rate, collecting two to three gallons per day of maple sap from a single tap is possible. Sap flow varies greatly, however, with factors such as temperature change, tree diameter, size of the tree's crown, and soil moisture content and conditions of the soil near the tree root system. We've launched a new YouTube channel for maple enthusiasts. Make maple syrup, subscribe and share with your friends. <laughs> I don't think so. But what I do know is this. Sap is a fluid that transports the nutrients, the goodness that the plant needs. It's the key for it getting all that it needs in order, in order to grow and to thrive. In the same way, I suppose, for us, that we need oxygen to get to all the parts of our body. But the thing is this, sap doesn't travel quickly. And when we're attached to the vine, we can't just plug ourselves in to Jesus and bang, it's done. It's a slow, lifelong process. But it's crucial that we persevere. That we remain connected to him and allow him to do what he needs to do in us. To provide us with that nourishment and goodness. There's been times in my life where I've tried really hard to be a Christian. But it doesn't work like that. Because when we try hard and we start to follow rules, it becomes a religion. We become like Pharisees, not disciples. If I were to watch a vine, and after some of the things I've said this morning, many of you will believe that I probably would do that. I would see that a branch doesn't get stressed if it doesn't produce fruit. It's not supposed to be difficult. Let Jesus do what he needs to do. Persevere in staying connected to him. And if you focus on the connection, that sap will flow. His spirit will flow into you and me. And the fruit will become your focus. Or the fruit will come rather because your focus is on Jesus. So today, as we close, are you blooming? What's stopping you from becoming fruitful for Jesus? Let me encourage you to allow yourself to be pruned this morning. Examine your heart. Which attitudes need getting rid of, need pruning, need taking away? Which relationship 
This morning, allow yourself to be purified by the power of his word. And persevere in abiding. When that storm comes, there's only one safe place to be. And that's when we're abiding and we're connected and we're protected by Jesus. Let me read you one verse as I close. Hebrews 12 verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. God wants to get rid of all those things that stop us being at full capacity for him. Will you allow yourself to be pruned, to be purified? And will you persevere in being connected? Let's bow our heads as we, as we pray. And I want to give you the opportunity this morning to just take a moment to respond. What is it, if we're being really honest, that God needs to prune? What is it that we need to let go of? And are we allowing God to begin that process of purifying us? What are you holding on to? A frustration, a hardship, a redundancy, a failed relationship? Or are you saying to God this morning, today, I'm going to sing like we said, in the middle of the storm. I'm going to worship until God, you shape me, you change me, and you give me a breakthrough. Father, for every person in this room, I pray that these words will be etched into our hearts this morning. That you will allow us to be pruned. As hard and as painful as that might seem. Father, get rid of anything that needs to go. May we be totally honest. May we not try to cling on to things that are no good for us. Things maybe that were, things that we don't need now. Get, help us to get rid of them. Help them to go. Father, take them from us. Father, may we be pruned so that you can enable us to be fruitful. Father, as, a, as, a, as the loving Father you are, we recognize that you want the best for us and that you discipline us so that in the long term we are fruitful. Father, may that be our prayer today. Help us to be fruitful. Amen. Just keep your head bowed, your eyes closed. Because I recognize this morning... There are people here that have not been able to sing that song, that I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, that Jesus has changed my life, that he's set me free, he's forgiven me from all the bad things I've done. And maybe you've never asked him into your life. I'm going to say a prayer that you can echo in your heart. If you really mean to to get to know God today, if you want to become a Christian, you need to get real with God and pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. I know I've got so much wrong. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you that because of your death, I can be free and forgiven forever. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to be the Lord of every part of me. Help me to live for you through the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, God's going to change you. God wants to forgive you of all you've done. If you've prayed that prayer, I want you to be brave. And I want you to put your hand up and I'll acknowledge you when you've done that and ask you to put your hand down again. Is there anybody here who wants to know Jesus? Thank you. Anybody anybody else? Father, thank you that there is salvation in this place this morning. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. Father, we rejoice today as the angels in heaven over one sinner that comes to you. Father, we love you. Father, just encourage us as we go. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. God bless you. See you really soon.